Hello and welcome to the latest technology spotlight, which is kindly brought to you by Resolve Biosciences. My name's Lucy and I'm the custom content producer here at Technology Networks. And today I'll be speaking with Benedict Nilgis about Resolve Biosciences spatial transcriptomics platform, Molecular Cartography. Benedict is a molecular biologist and biotechnologist by training, and his current work focuses on the spatial aspects of biological processes. And he can draw on a decade of experiences in nucleic acid biology using transcriptomics and multi-omics approaches in a variety of systems, from viruses to eukaryotic cells and vertebrate models. This has made him acutely aware of the fundamental importance of 3D organization of biology from the subcellular to tissue level. At Resolve Biosciences, Benedict helps researchers tackle spatial challenges to provide them with a more holistic molecular view of their samples. You're about to see our interview with Benedict in full. Hi Benedict, how are you? Hi Lucy, I'm very, doing very well, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, and thank you for joining us here today. Uh, firstly, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your role at Resolve Biosciences? Well, of course. Thanks, thanks for uh, for having me uh, first. So I'm I'm Benedict. Um, I'm a molecular biologist. I work as a scientist for Resolve Biosciences, and my training is mainly transcriptomics and, and translatomics. And what I've been able to do now at Resolve Biosciences is add some add a spatial component to this because we are doing spatial transcriptomics. Um, but also work with the first wave of our early access customers and many external partners that we have. Uh, that help us um, really um, get to know our molecular cartography uh, platform a lot more that we're going to talk about today. And how would you describe the evolution of spatial transcriptomics in your area? Well, spatial transcriptomics is really the next evolutionary steps from technologies that, that came before it. So on the one hand, that would of course be uh, microarrays and RNA sequencing, so really bulk transcriptomics technologies, as well as then later on, single cell RNA sequencing, which gives you a much higher resolution, but lacks any spatial component, right? Because you're stuck at the single cell level. And then on the other hand, you have technologies that are that are imaging based, right? Like your standard um, um, immunostainings, for example. Those give you spatial information, but you have very low multiplexing capabilities. So you only look at a few genes or proteins at a time. So the logical evolution towards spatial transcriptomics then was to, to integrate these two things in one another. And there were some technologies that, um, that did that in the past, but they mostly had either low sensitivity or low spatial resolution uh, and were limited often also in the number of targets that we could actually detect at the time. Um, so our technology, molecular cartography, really takes this to the next level um, by combining everything that's good about microscopy, really spatial technologies and transcriptomic technologies and getting you a very nice integrated view um, on what you can do there. And we believe that this is really a new foundation for lots of cutting edge, edge science that you can do in this field. And your spatial transcriptomics platform, Molecular Cartography, has allowed users to make discoveries in oncology, neuroscience and infectious diseases, providing them with a new depth of information. Could you tell us a bit more about the platform? Yes, so um, we really have partners that are that are active in, in, in a lot of very diverse fields and it has been great working with them um, these, these last uh, couple of years. Um, so what molecular cartography does in essence is it generates a spatial map of right now uh, RNA molecules. So it gives you an image with lots of dots on it. They're fully digital and customizable, of course. So those are coordinates of genuine single individual RNA molecules for up to 100 genes um, in parallel. So what we do is in a, in a given sample, we can we image millions of these individual RNA molecules in, in one experiment from tens of thousands of cells. Mm -hmm. um, we can do that from everything from, from a cultured cells by an organoid to, to a complex tissue. So we've done a number of tissues and a number of species there. Um, and all of this works really by targeting transcripts, so RNA molecules with DNA probes. And to these DNA probes, we can attach fluorophores. And um, the, the key uh, thing that we do is that we can selectively attach and detach fluorophores from these, from these probes. Um, so um, what we do is we, we, we attach a fluorophore, we take an image of a sample, which gives us lots of colorful dots in, in this image, essentially. What we can then do is we can remove them. And in the next round, we can tag the same or different transcripts with a different set of fluorophores. 
um, image those, remove the signal, rinse and repeat. So if we do that a couple of times, that allows us to generate a code of fluorophores uh, that we can then use to identify all of these different multiplex transcripts at very high subcellular resolution um, in our tissue. And that's, that's, that's really where we come from and what the data essentially is. And we can combine this next to this, to this core data with additional dyes or antibody stainings to give context to our now highly contextualized uh, spatial data that we generate. And can you talk us through some of the challenges with this area of research? Yes, yeah, certainly. So most aspects of biology are at their core spatial. And this is something that we've just known not that much about before. And so if you look at a standard transcriptomics data set, um, then you get lots of information on lots of different genes and lots of different cells. And that in the past has actually allowed us to identify all the major players really that play a role in neuroscience or oncology or in infectious diseases. So we know roughly which cell types are active. We know which genes are active as well, but we have no idea how these are linked spatially. So we can have two genes where we think, well, these probably interplay together to counteract the disease, for example. Um, but in the sample, they might actually be so far apart um, that any direct interaction between them is, is completely impossible. So that would be something that you would have if we just had a single cell RNA-seq data set with some, some basic microscopy. So you know how and why, but you can't really narrow down the what yet. Um, and that is really where, where spatial technologies could come in and provide a lot of benefit. So a very good example for, for this problem where you actually need the spatial resolution would be something like the tumor microenvironment, where you have diseased cancer tissue um, that is very interlinked with invading immune cells um, from, from, the, from the sick person that really tries to try to clear the cancer. You have blood vessels in there, lots of other cells that really don't have anything to do with the disease in the first place. And this interplay between all of these cell types is very closely spatially linked. And often you need to have direct cell-to-cell -cell contact to make things happen. And you have to be able to have the resolution to do that. So you need to really distinguish cells on a transcriptomic level that are directly next to one another. So if you have a resolution of a few hundred micrometers even, that is nowhere near enough what you need. You need to have at least cellular resolution. And that's the challenge that people have faced so far. And how has molecular cartography enabled you to overcome those kind of challenges? Yeah, by, by providing exactly what we just talked about, right? By providing this spatial context to our, our rough understanding that we already have of many of these processes. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of saying, hey, there's some genes that are doing something in this area, we can now really look at something like the tumor microenvironment and say, well, this cell is next to this cell, and if that happens, then they change in this way. And this could actually be a sign of clearing the tumor or of resistance of the tumor to, uh, to, to drugs, to answer anti-cancer therapy, for example. And we make that possible not just because of the nice resolution and everything that we offer, but also because of the design tools and the analysis tools that we have, uh, and the, the tools that actually design the probes that make this quite a convenient workflow. Um, yeah. And that helps in oncology, but also in something like Alzheimer's disease, for example, mm -hmm. which is a very, very spatial disease. So there you would have um, these plaques that form in your brain, which are the site of pathology. So this is really where you get uh, loss of neurons and neurodegeneration. And that's, that's what's causing the problems down the line. Um, so we can really look at these sites of the pathology and we can identify that in our essay, actually. So we can not only detect transcripts, but we can also use dyes and antibodies to visualize other things like Alzheimer's plaques. And then we can really directly see how do the cells in the vicinity of this interact with one another? How do they interact with the plaque? What process try to clear the plaque? What, which process add to it? What causes neuronal damage? Uh, all of these things in a very, very nice and integrated data set uh, that really allows you to, to get, pull out a lot of information from this. And we think it's really key to understanding and ultimately combating these diseases in the, in the long run. And can you describe the key applications of the technology to us? Yes, of course. Well, there is two levels to, to look at this really. Um, so one thing that you can, you can do as a researcher who's already busy in the field for a long time uh, would be that you add a spatial context to, to data um, that you already have. 
And the second thing that you can do with molecular cartography is really going a step beyond what is possible now. Um, but let's let, let's stick to the firmware first, right? So many of the people that we collaborate with have single cell RNA sequencing data, for example, for the for the thing that they're interested in, um, the, the biological process, the, the disease. So they know what cell types are there. They're just missing where they are. So that is provided by molecular cartography, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but on top of that, um, we actually allow you to integrate these data sets into one another. So you can get some molecular cartography information for your 100 genes uh, and use these to um, see what cell types you have there. And what mm -hmm. you can then do is you can take your single cell RNA seq stat and map that set onto the tissue based on the molecular cartography framework of the map where things should be, and actually get insights that go beyond the 100 genes that we look at with molecular cartography, and that allow you to draw actually very new hypothesis from such an integration of an existing and a novel spatial data set. Um, so that would be option one. You already have some idea what's going on and some prime, some, some pre-data before you go spatial. And the, th the second thing would really go be going beyond this. So I talked before about us having subcellular resolution. And what that actually means is that we can not only say this RNA molecule belongs to the cell, but we can actually see if this RNA is in the nucleus or in cytoplasm or in a projection of the cell. And these positions can allow you to infer function, of course. Um, and more than that, um, since you have millions of these, you can actually do analyses that look at uh, relative distances of different RNA molecules to one another. So you can actually generate dendrograms of the different processes and RNA localization that you have in a cell without even doing cell segmentation and get a lot of insights um, that way. So not about the where things are, but actual functional insights of which pathways uh, play a role in which cell um, and, and what's, what's going on there exactly. So that's fantastic to look at. Uh, and actually also quite, uh, quite pretty if you look, you look at the data. <laughs> And why would you recommend the platform and the technology to researchers working in the field? Um, well, the main reason is biology is per definition spatial, right? Mm -hmm. We are three-dimensional organisms <laughs> and just looking at a single cell or an isolate of some DNA or RNA that comes from there is really not representative of what biology actually is. It's spatial interplay of things. Um, and we are convinced that molecular cartography, but because of the, the reasons and examples we, we already discussed about here, adds a lot of value to this and a lot of value for many scientific applications. So I think that uh, many people in your audience or 90% of the projects of people in your audience have a clear spatial component to them. Mm -hmm. And we can certainly help out there in ways that have just not been able to look at before. Um, and the value that we add on this is not only novelty, but also um, increasing the, uh, the speed at which science can be done. So what you would have needed to do so far to get information that is at least similar to what we provide is you would have needed to do something transcriptomicsy, right? Something that generates data on transcriptomes. And you would have needed to do a lot of imaging and you would have needed to optimize both branches of this. You would have months or worst case a PhD thesis works of work, uh, mm -hmm. work, of work just to figure out what is going on. Now you just do one molecular cartography experiment and we make it easy. Probe design is very easy. You just, we have a web tool. You just type in the genes that you're interested in. Probes will be generated, no problem. We have downstream analysis tools that you can make this easy to deal with. So no matter if you are someone who is very good at transcriptomics but knows nothing about space, about microscopy, or if you're someone who does, looks at images all day, but is not that comfortable with transcriptomics, we make that possible, we bring it together without much prior knowledge. Um, and this is really the key. It's great data and you can get it very easily. And we have a service offering um, that we are currently rolling out. Uh, so you can even have us do it instead of worrying about it yourself. So you just send us your sample we take care of the rest. You get very nice data. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for having me. This was great.